New York and on the new Hot 97 app, Ebro in the Morning. On Hot 97. Ebro in the Morning, Laura Styles, Rosenberg, give it up for Kathy Iandoli on the program right yeah. now. Yeah. Kathy, uh, we've talked to you, uh, I think, in the past for the book you did with uh, Prodigy. Yeah, Commissary Kitchen. Yeah. Um, and then there was another um, after that. Did you have another book after that? No, just no, this one. Just this one. Mm -hmm. um, God Save the Queens, The Essential History of Women in Hip Hop. Mm. Go get it. Fire. Um Now, Gabrielle Union gave you a, a quote for this book. Um, who all did you speak to in wow. putting this whole thing together? Just give us some of the big... You know, big names, big names. Well, the biggest name, Laura. Is Thank you. Laura Stiles. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Moni Love, Yo-Yo, uh, Rod Zega, Bahamadia, Megan Thee Stallion. Um, I have some quotes from Nicki Minaj, Remy Ma, Lil, Lil Kim. I'm like, Lil Kim. Uh, who else? Who else? Uh, Ladybug Mecca. I spoke with Questlove. Just a lot of people. And what I did was... You know, I pulled from like 20 years of interviews and got some of that um, those quotes in there. I have a, a Nicki Minaj interview in there from like 2009. So it was really cool to be able to put that in and, and show her perspective at that time. Uh, it says here, far, uh, for far too long, the history of hip hop has revolved around the men, the male DJs, MCs, producers, money makers, and creative minds who built the parks and rec rooms of New York City and art form. Uh, that has become the dominating cultural force all over the world. But is this singular narrative the complete history of hip hop? Mm. Um, and we uh, we have had a conversation periodically in hip hop, and I've been in this long enough to have seen it a few times, right? right. Where it just feels like the women are absent, mm -hmm. right? And and as a as a media guy, one of the things that I would always talk to our staff about um, when I was programming was that our ability to get the most listeners is actually our growth is stunted when there aren't women present making the music. So we wow. got to make those next superstars, right? Because right. when you're turning into a radio station, if you're only hearing one perspective, you're only getting one type of listener. Mm -hmm. And while they may be hit songs and things like that, if you don't have women present in some shape or whether it's R&B voices or rap voices. Right. You got to have that balance. But as a radio person, we don't make, you know, I don't make music. So the music's got to get made and it's got to become hits. And right. we can try to help in many ways. But I remember when Nicki came along, there was a lull. Yeah. Before Nicki, right? Where it was like, I think I think I think we even had this combo where it was like Gwen Stefani was like the most rappingest artist. No, 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 no. We, we said that about, what's about, um, what's her face? Why am I feel so bad? Uh, Black Eyed Peas. Fergie. Fergie. Oh, Fergie, Fergie, Fergie was the rapper. Fergie. There you go. Fergie was like, you know, rhyming with the black eyed peas. And I was like, right. this is all hip hop has right now, which <laughs> it was good, but it was legit pop. It was a straight up pop. And it was legit right. all that people for, I would say, maybe two or three years. Yeah. Um, is that what prompted you to kind of make sure you cemented this in history? Yeah, it was crazy because um, when I first put the idea out there it was in 2009. And um, a lot of the publishers turned me down because uh, they wanted to do a book um, where it was like three women that represented like three different parts of just hip hop history. So they were like, OK, so we have a Queen Latifah. You could do Queen Latifah, Lauryn Hill. You don't have a third. And I was like a third. I mean, there's like 50 women to choose from. But it, in, in the minds of like, I guess, mainstream publishing, they, they just couldn't see it. And this was literally like moments before Nicki hit. Right. So once that happened, I kind of just sat on it and then. It was last year that, you know, I was like, you know what, <laughs> maybe I should try to put that through again. And, um, you know, Neil Martinez Belkin, who did the Gucci book and the Rick Ross book, I spoke to him and he put me in touch with my agent, Robert Ginsler, who was like, you got to put this book out. Like, it's it's time. Hurry up. <laughs> like, do it. So yeah. I, I put this proposal together and it was just crazy because everyone was so interested in it. And, you know, in the conversations... The things that they were mentioning, like they were just like, yeah, it's the perfect time because of Cardi B. And I thought that was really crazy because, you know, to think about putting a book out because of what was happening in mainstream hip hop with a woman and, and just having all these people just be like, yeah, Cardi B. It, it was just insane because when I tried to do it 10 years prior where there were still women on the scene, there, there was Eve, you know, and Trina. But for people to say there was nothing really after Lauren. 
now everyone was really just consumed by hip hop, and it was just really cool to see that. Well, hip hop's bigger than it's ever been. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right? So you have that part. You have social media, mm -hmm. right? Driving that. And you have the fact that Cardi B, who Rosenberg says is um, bigger than, um, who'd you say she was bigger than? Ludacris at his height. Yeah, bigger than Ludacris at his height. Never been more sure of an argument in my life. Oh um, my God. You know, <laughs> it Shirley is Cardi B, Cardi B has become, because of the Kardashians and because of these things that she's tied to, and her husband, who's, you know, his own, with his own group, who's big. Um, it does make it easy for somebody who wants to make some money to go, yeah, let's talk about women in hip-hop because right. but, I get it. But, but Cardi also was also a huge conversation because she was one of the, the, the artists that basically had to hide her pregnancy and reveal that you can have a baby yes. and still be successful. That was a huge conversation because yeah. I, during that Cardi conversation, I know I had spoken to a lot of female artists who were literally not booked while they were pregnant. Mm -hmm. who had trouble getting even any kind of respect. They're like, mm, you're pregnant right now. We're not sure if we can even, like, work with you right now. So a lot of these women have dealt with that behind the scenes, quietly. Yeah, when, when Rodzega got her deal, she was eight months pregnant, but she hid it really well the whole time. And she was like, I was really nervous because they had said, you know, basically, oh, so you're at the end of the pregnancy anyway, so cool. You know, when she got her deal... Um, they didn't realize she was pregnant, but when they realized it was like towards the end anyway, they were okay with it. But she was like, yeah, I, I was afraid I wasn't going to get my record deal. Mm. Yeah. And even, and Raw existed in a time too, that, that sort of pocket where there wasn't a ton going on besides Lauren, where like, yeah, it felt like the women in the crew were sort of treated like a novelty act to some mm -hmm. extent, whether it's Raw Digger or Lady of Rage or whoever, they existed in these big hip hop, uh, Cruise. What years is? What years were we? Imperial. About? Rod Digger's album came out in like '99, something like that, um, and it's great. The album's yeah. like really it's slept on. Great Post album. Lauren, Missy still kind of popping, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, you have Missy, um, but Missy. You had, you had Kim too. Yeah, Me but Kim. Missy, but Missy occupied Missy occupied her own space, right? Mm -hmm. Missy was sort of a singer rapper, like yeah, like art artiste. You know, she was mm -hmm. occupied her yeah. own thing. Rod Digger was like a straight up. Spitting ass MC. Yeah, she said that um the reason why she got her deal was they said that she looked a little like Lauren, so they were like, wow. yeah, wow. you resem we resemble Lauren. But um she told me this story and, and it's in the book where she went to her first photo shoot and um they were putting extensions in her hair and she started to cry <laughs> because she was like, what's happening? But um she grew to really she was like, I grew to like it, you know, I, I grew to like glam. But um even in the video when she's wearing like a tight fitted suit, the the video for tight. Uh, she got a lot of backlash where they were like, oh, now you're selling out. So this is the part where you leave all of us on, on the hyper lyrical tip. Lauren caught that yeah. hit right. too. Like people yes. forget that when, you know, the Fugees put out that album, um, the score, um, the the Killing Me Softly, they sent cease and desist to radio stations so to crazy. not play that song. Yeah, I remember that. Because they did not want, A, Lauren didn't want to sing. She wanted to be seen as a rapper. She did not want to sing. I don't even think she wanted to record the song. And if you remember in the music video, she's not singing. They're just sitting in a movie theater. Yeah. That, the way that story went, um, the original song was called um, Killing a Sound Boy. You hear a little clip about it. Like, you hear a little clip of it right before Killing Me Softly on the score, where she's saying, strumming dub plates with our fingers, eliminate mm. sounds of a song. So when they brought it to Roberta Flack, and the writers are killing me softly with this song. They were like, uh, you're not doing this. You're not turning this into a rap song. Mm -hmm. um, Lauren has a long rap verse. I know it by heart, but I'm not going to do it now. <laughs> um, and that was going to be the song. And they said, you're not doing that. So that's why they opted to have them just do a straight cover. Watch and literally change music history. Yeah. yeah. I mean, d does any of that stuff go the same? Does Lauren become the Lauren Hill who gets seven Grammys? No. Or, no. I don't no. think any of that happens without killing me softly. It's hard Ooh. to even explain how big that record is now in retrospect. Mm -hmm. Who are some of the artists that opened up to you during the book that really surprised you? Trina. You know, Trina gave me some really good perspective in the book about what she was going through. And I think we forget sometimes Trina's consistency. You know, mm. maybe it wasn't, for even during like the early aughts, maybe she wasn't just like hitting the charts um, on, on the high numbers. But Trina's been consistent. And I think that's why... She's galvanized this fan base and, and this new army of women who, like, all of the new artists, when they talk about who inspired them, Trina. it's always all Trina. Day. All day. Yeah, like City Girls, Megan, Cash, you know, they all talk about Trina. Uh, she really opened up. Moni Love opened up. She tells me this story about how, you know, when she first got here from London, 
she was taping down her breasts and she had to shave her head and she was wearing like really baggy clothes because when she got into the club, all of like the top tier Def Jam artists, the guys were trying to hit on her. Like they didn't, they didn't think she could rap. And she's like, I went home and I just like shaved my head and taped down my breast and I went back in there to spit and everyone was really impressed. But just thinking about that, Ladybug Mecca talking about how um, during the Diggable Planets photo shoot, they had the guys, they were supposed to be dressed like a jazz ensemble and her first stylist was like, I think you should wear a cat suit in the middle of two guys with like hard bottom shoes and trousers. <laughs> like just things I was just like, whoa. Or even like Bahamadia where she self-managed herself. So she just uh, kept reading like Donald Passman's book to just try to figure out how to go into her meetings and negotiate the right deals. And, you know, you hear the music, you see the interviews and you meet a lot of these artists. But I don't think any of us well. You you guys do, especially, you know, um, the little Kim interview that you had most recently. I, I cite that in the book. Well, from recent, from when I was writing it. But you never really ask an artist, like, what have you been through? You never ask a woman, what have you been through? You never ask a black woman, what have you been through? And I think that was the biggest set of questions that I wanted to ask because that's never been really presented, especially not in book form. Now, um, you writing several things even outside of, I mean, obviously you've dealt with a lot of hip hop. One of the, you know, the, the kind of patriarchal social component that women have to navigate through uh, just in regular life right. before you even start talking about career, right? right. Um, would you say as a woman, the stories you heard, um, are they unique to just hip hop or is this a universal woman's story even outside of dealing with the rap world? Uh, I think it. I think you can maybe eliminate the word hip hop from a lot of the stories, and it would exist in a boardroom, or even in a coffee shop if you're a barista. I think there's a lot of parallels that we can draw to any um, business or any part of society. But there are things that I think in the book really do speak specifically to hip hop, especially since we're talking about something that started literally outdoors in a jam and has now surpassed and rock and street roll. culture yeah right and surpassed rock and roll now yeah, like, like strip genre. clubs and right. yeah. you know uh all of that world of doing drugs smoking weed yeah. drinking people being drunk around you all the time mm -hmm. being in you know that kind of whole street thing you can't necessarily apply that to corporate america but in some regards you can right yeah the good old boy network and the only reason Absolutely. i bring it up is because a lot of times you hear these conversations around where hip-hop is so difficult for women and my thing is like hip-hop's not really removed from the rest of culture in that yeah. regard it yeah. is it is interesting though and slightly different in the sense that i think we have to be realistic about the fact that a lot of the music still does celebrate misogyny more right. than other pop music, music yes for sure you know what i'm saying so like we have to be real about that part mm -hmm. of it and how many artists that we even think of as like being somewhat progressive right. if you still listen to them right, have right, lines right. in there about the way they're treating women that you're like oof, this is still you know we're not all the way there yet are you kathy are you generally happy with where things are for women in hip-hop right now as artists I am, but I'm I'm cautiously optimistic because I think the thing that, you know, has me just with a raised eyebrow is the way that women are being regarded collectively like they're in the new hip hop subgenre. Like, you know, we had mumble rap, we had SoundCloud rap, now we have women rap. Never even that's, heard of this before. That's that's the thing that I'm most concerned about, that we're not collect that that this is not just some collective hashtag that's gonna go away because something else is going to happen. So I wanna see what's going to happen in the next few years. Because what what we're doing now when you're talking about hip hop is you're lumping all the women together always again. But this time since everyone's getting along, it reminds me of the ecosystem of SoundCloud where all the guys like hung out with each other and it became like this one big family. And because all the women are getting along for the most part, that's wonderful. But I want to see what the marketing machine does next and how they choose to treat it. Because it's now, I, you know, I said this in a previous interview, it's no longer just female, like talented women in hip hop. It's just talented hip hop artists. And if we can get to that point, we're going forward it's not just a bunch of women lumped in the same category because you can't really put Cardi B in the same sentence as Megan Thee Stallion, in the same sentence as Rhapsody, in the same sentence as Tierra Whack, in the same sentence as No Name. They're all so different. Mm -hmm. So to put them all into one big category, like ladies are doing it. Like I just want to see what happens next. Do you think that I feel <clears throat> I have, I think it's difficult uh, when you're analyzing hip hop, period 
the role of women is complicated in the sense that from what the genre seems to want and what the fans seem to gravitate towards, mm -hmm. it still feels like sexuality is what really takes people to the next level. Mm -hmm. And like, if you look back at the history, we have our ladybugs and our Latifas and our lights and all these people that existed. Right. But in the last decade, decade and a half, yes, when Jermaine Dupri had that conversation with Rhapsody about where women are, and Rhapsody mm -hmm. made the point, but there's this and there's that, I. I don't think Jermaine did a great job expressing himself. <laughs> right. However, the idea, though, that from a commercial look, mm -hmm. you see a lot of the same imagery. I don't think that's an unfair How is that assessment. different from the men, though? In a, on a commercial hip-hop sense, I feel like the men are mostly talking about having sex or being in a strip club or, or some sort of material and... drugs. Material. It's, it's all cheap. I guess my point is it's all cheap. Yeah, yeah. But, we, there, but I think there's more diversity at the top of the, the chart. From, I think men are flexible. They have the option to yes, do whatever they for want. for sure. I right. give you that. But I'm just saying the popular songs tend to lean in the... Trash. In the... It, of all... In the lane of sexualizing women... Sex, strip clubs, But if I was to go drugs. over a list of who the biggest men in hip-hop are and who the biggest women of are course, in hip-hop right yeah. now, I could give you diversity in what those men's characters I appear see. like. I yes. know what you're saying, but yeah. I, we also can celebrate because I think like the Rhapsodies, the Tierra Wax, I've seen them get more love than in a long time. It's been a while since they've been celebrated like that. Well, what, what's yeah. your take on it? Well, I, I think we also have to look at like um, historical perspective of like when when these things started happening and why they started happening. If you're starting with like what was going on with the little Kim Foxy Brown era, if, if I'm guessing that's what you're referencing. A couple of years prior to that, it was 1992, it was called the Year of the Woman, and it kicked off the highest rates of sexual assault. So what also was happening was um, the rise of gangster rap and women being called, you know, a bunch of bees Bitches and, and hoes. Yeah. Oh, we could say bitches and hoes, cool. Bitches and hoes. Um, so what happened after that was owning sexuality and talking about it as aggressively as possible. So now if we're going back to that right, right now, if we're talking about 2019, you talk about a few years prior to that, the Me Too movement, mm -hmm. Time's Up. So really I consider this stuff not just um, a general interest in sexuality, I consider it sex positivity and you know grabbing control over the narrative and doing it in a way that spins it on how the rest of society is viewing it. So if we're looking at those two periods of time, they're it kind of sense. parallel. Yeah, that, that is interesting. Yeah, so it's just but you, really... So, but that also does speak to the fact that you do see right now that commercially, mm -hmm. that is sort of a lot of the image that's being put out there. You just there, think the reasoning behind it, there's a there's a logic to it that makes sense. There is a logic to it. and I, But I think also there's a flip side to it, too, because when Rhapsody released Eve and she was going through um, all of these powerful women, there's, there's a way to express the rage... Um, or the outrage, rather, for what was going on in society. And you can either be like, yeah, I'm going to talk about it this way or I'm going to talk about it that way. And I think that's what 96 did for us, too. And when you're talking about that, like, kind of lull in hip-hop, societally speaking, we didn't really have a lot of things going on to, to point. Yes, things were women were still being undermined and we were being othered. Um, but the... The just bringing it to the forefront was not as apparent during that time period. And, you know, women still had stuff to say, but it just wasn't as loud. So I think now, yeah, we're, we're seeing a lot of that hypersexualization and that sex positivity. But I still think that there's a nice balance. But I, I know what you mean, where, where when it comes on a radio level and, and even on a just a a streaming level, whatever. Yeah, there's there's a talk of sex, but... I don't think we... And the reason I brought up the dudes making sex records, too, is just because I, I, I always just want to point socially to what, the things we're interested in as a mm -hmm. culture, right? We are a sex-driven society, for better or for worse. Right. Like, that's... The, I mean, up to the president right now who's got, you know, whatever <sighs> his allegations are with a porn star. You know what I mean? It's just like people eat sex. It's sex. Mm -hmm. Sex sells. Like, that's you know, a slogan that everybody knows. And I think that people, while yes, sex positivity and yes, women who have been othered and, uh, um, you know, kind of, uh, um, you know, uh, sexualized, they're right. taking that back. Like, yo, you're not, you know, I, I'll take control of how I'm sexualized. You know what I'm saying? So I, I do, I see both sides of it, but I think you don't get beyond it until you allow the individuals who are the victims to have their right. own voice and you respect their voice, and then it becomes, it morphs into other things after right, that. Right, and then where do you go next? Right. So, that, yeah. so that's the thing. It'll be curious to see where we go over the Because next this generation years. of women in rap are just getting their voice. Yeah. 
Like yeah. they're just like if you're making a sound to a 22, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, Tierra Whack, finding her path of creativity. Uh, Rhapsody, who we've Rhapsody. loved for a while, I think this is uh, another big moment for her, back to back big moments. Right. My concern um, is that people like Tierra Whack and the Lizzo's and the people who are sort of alternative mm-hmm. end up being successful, not in hip hop though. Well, I think it's elsewhere. That's my concern. Okay. It's hard enough for a woman to still climb up the charts, you know, a hip hop artist, a, a female hip hop artist. So I think if you're talking about 10 male artists and seven of them are talking about sex, they'll still be able to point to three hit makers who aren't, let's say. And if there's only two women who are getting through the charts and two of them are talking about sex, it's a lot easier to say, well, women are just generally talking about sex, which is not necessarily Mm -hmm. the case because if you give me the same number of female artists as male artists and put them all on the charts, I think the balance will lean in the favor of men talking about sex more than women. Agreed, but the problem is the men who consume will not put that many women on the chart. That's, my, that's <laughs> the thing. So well, the that's why when women, when, women start, when women start leaning in and wanting to hear other women's stories and, and those things, it's, you start to see a rise, right? Mm-hmm. And, but, you know, and I think Nikki really locked into that yes. recently. And you had Cardi lock into something that was relatable to other women as well. And then you have Megan who locked into it too. Um, there is sexualization in there, but guess what a lot of women are going through? Being sexualized. Yeah. So... That's where the relatability comes in, and that's a social issue. Did you got did um, you know we've talked and you hear it in the WNBA, you hear it in uh, women's soccer, right? About how you know equal pay and you know like we've talked on this show a lot. You know, I feel like the the men's soccer team shouldn't even have sponsors. Like they don't even win games. Like the sponsors should <laughs> legit be like, look, we're not even spot you, until you start winning. Like mm-hmm. all the money goes to the women. Right like, at this point. Um, uh, the consumer yeah. watching and loving the the content and the entertainment. A- anywhere in the book, are you dealing with the fans of the music um, and how it, they were uplifting these artists as well and, and how these artists connected to other women as well? Yeah, so on the fan level... Well, when you were talking about the equal pay part, I wanted to I wanted to point that out for a sec because um, I cover that in in an in an interesting way in the book. I think um, I started with uh, Sparky D, right? Mm. So what was happening in the past was um, a lot of the artists uh, back then in the '80s were uh, the male artists were getting invited to perform uh, at shows and they were getting paid. So what they would do is they would invite the women after they've already cut the checks, and then they would just casually say, "Hop on stage and do your song." And she, then one song would become three, but she's not getting paid. And then they would just send her away. And, and it kind of clicked, um, you know, with Sparky where she was like, okay, so at some point all of these guys are getting paid and, and thank you for the exposure, but you're leaving with a check. So that was something that, that I thought was really interesting that I'd never thought about. But then also when I spoke with Trina and her talking about being told that she had to get on stage wearing designer clothes and being made up and having a full team of dancers – in order to get on a tour, but then being told she was too expensive to tour because of those things, mm. I think was just a mm. weird. No, it's a real conversation. <laughs> it's a real, it's a real conversation. I've, I've I've actually heard people say like, mm, deal, working with a female artist is just too much of a headache. It's the, it's, it's the appearance yeah. and the nails too expensive. I've heard people dismiss them like this just because of that. It's crazy. And then telling her you have to do this. And she was like, I'll do my own makeup to get on that stage. And she's like, and meanwhile, I'm on a bill with a bunch of guys who show up in sweatpants. And, you know, that was pretty, pretty crazy. And Uh, once again, back to society, let's be honest. Who who is the, what, why is it happening? happening? And Mm -hmm. a lot of it happens, dudes can show up in sweatpants or whatever because society accepts them that way. Right. And socially, women are forced into this space of thinking they need all the products and they need Mm -hmm. all of the nails and they need all of these things to feel beautiful. Mm -hmm. Um, And other women and men even judge those women. So Mm -hmm. it's... I mean, just when you look at it, the amount of... of, If you break... If the women who have been stars in Mm hip-hop, what percentage are exceptionally attractive? Like 98%. Exceptionally attractive. In the men... (laughs) <laughs> that is not the case <laughs> at all. So when you start right there, you already know how fucked up this whole thing is off top. Right. right you know, right. no. People don't look at Kendrick Lamar as his, for his style. No one even knows what he dresses like. Biggie just, told you yeah. he was fat, black, and ugly yes. as ever. Right. That's part of the brand. Mm-hmm. So, and but people were so mesmerized by what they actually did. 
Mm -hmm. And um, it seems like with being a woman, not only do you have to mesmerize people with what you do, mm -hmm. but you also have to be in, in exceptional to look at. Right. Well, and you have to be figure out a way to do it in an inexpensive way. And coming up, that's in, it's so hard. All, all the female artists I've known on their rise, yes. it's really hard when they're in that in-between space where they're not quite popping yet. Right. Because when you get on stage and you don't have the money to look right, you're now being compared to everything else out there. Yes. And to be honest, and you kind of look at it, you're like, down. you're like, oh, she kind of isn't all the way prime time yet. Like, she doesn't have the look yet. <laughs> you know what I think about when I think of that? Um, do you ever watch, like, one of those, like, scripted reality shows, like The Hills or something, mm -hmm. and how um, only a handful of people are actually part of the show, and then they have, like, the background people. So, like, there was this one episode I remember where they had... Um, it was like Audrina. I don't know why I'm even talking about this, but uh, Audrina on the Hills, she had full glam, right. but all of her coworkers weren't part of MTV. So, so they, they just looked like they were just putting on their own makeup. So like you know, you could clearly tell. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It, it just like it's so glamorous. Everybody else looked like they rolled out of bed, and they might have tried really hard. But relative <laughs> but to someone who's getting the yeah. full glam, yeah. Uh, God save the queens. The essential history of women in hip hop. Kathy always doing great work, um, and as you could tell, very informed and uh, and um, and detailed. I'm very excited to read this. Thanks. We're very proud of you, Kathy. Good job. I'm Kathy. actually going to complete Good job, this book. Kath. <laughs> I'm going to text you after I read this. I'm going to finish this book, which for me is hard. I hope you love it. You're all thanked in the in the shout outs. Oh, too. really? Yeah. Um, oh, that's dope. And you yeah. have a lovely tribute to your mom at the start of the book. It was yeah, very and, and at the end. Um, my 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 epilogue is is pretty crazy because you know my mom uh, got sick when I got my book deal and she passed away by the time I finished it. I know Ebro knows this all too well. When we were doing our interview, that was when I was called about um, her being oh, right. yeah. in for the hospital. But um, in the beginning of the book, I speak with um, the first uh, female MC soloist, who's Debbie D. Uh, she was in Beat Street, Us Girls, and she's now become a pastor. And I spoke with her. At the beginning, um, during that time period, and my mom was in the hospital, you know, the week that she was going to leave, and the day that she passed away that morning, Debbie D came to the hospital and anointed my mom. Wow, that's beautiful. Whoa. Yeah. That's so it was a crazy full circle moment for me. Us girls can boogie too. Mm -hmm. You guys don't know about us girls? Never mind. Beach Street, sorry. You know what's <laughs> crazy? That, that someone who's known it to be the first... The first of her kind yeah. would be such an unknown name, generally speaking, to mainstream. Yeah. Think about what that says also. There's also like the argument of who was first. You know, we think about Shah Rock too or Pebbly Poo. I mean, a lot of women at the time were all rising to the forefront. But what I talk about in the book is Debbie was like, um, she when I met her, she broke out this big book of flyers. And she's like, you have to just look at the flyers. Who was on flyers billed as a soloist? Mm. And wow. um, she had this entire book. She calls herself a flyerologist. And I was like looking through and like, where's that? See. She wow. has it. Bring her on. She'll Is it somebody's putting this out? Like, what are no, we that's doing? her book of flyers. She she kept all her flyers. But it's, she hasn't like um, made a. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I don't know what I would do with it. If I like, you know, she came like when we sat down for our interview. She had it. She ready. came with this giant binder of flyers and it was crazy too because you forget sometimes how young all the kids were so what they were doing on the flyers was letting them know all the middle schools and high schools that were going were invited to the jams mm -hmm. and the all the lists of all the people and um and the artists that were performing we're talking like 20 people and she's like and it was all guys and like you know Debbie D and I was like and, and DJ Wanda D who's her DJ I was like what and then you know you start to see more women being billed but that's how she credits being the first mm -hmm. because she's like I have the paper proof that that's those are the only history books we have from the pioneer right, era right 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 that's, that's incredible yeah. yo Kathy love you man congratulations, love you guys. congratulations thank you Kathy. god save the queens go get it